Uh, Professor Dr. Shafton, over to you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, following the war in the Ukraine and recent events in the Middle East, what we've seen is a better understanding of the misperceptions that particularly people in the West had about what's happening in Europe and in the Middle East. It, it's interesting because it has implications on the global level. Of course, what is happening in the Ukraine now impacts not only Europe, what is happening in the Middle East for many decades has an impact again on the world balance of power. So the fact that we had deep misperceptions about what is going on there is important and correcting these misperceptions, learning from the experience of recent months and recent years, both in Europe and in the Middle East can be helpful. Let me start with what I believe is the core of these misperceptions. First of all, the difficulty of, that many people have in thinking strategically. We are focusing on what the media are focusing to a very large extent, namely on things that are very exciting and very interesting in terms of what's happening today and the very near future. And there is less tendency to look at a somewhat longer distance, to look at a somewhat broader picture. And many people, including unfortunately uh, professionals, in the, on, on the political level and academics are, have difficulties in, in thinking and looking at things strategically. Second, and this is very serious in the Western world, perhaps not so much of a problem beyond Europe and North America and some other countries with a similar tradition, is that recently because of the fear because of the apprehension, the understandable apprehension from saying something racist, we have stopped looking at cultures and we are not willing to speak about the impact of culture on human behavior and the impact of different cultures on different groups and their leaders. Because the assumption, the wrong assumption, the distorted assumption is that if you say something about a national collective, then you're by necessity making a racist statement. And instead of having a serious debate about culture, because you cannot understand human behavior without the enormous impact of culture on human behavior, we have been very careful, too careful, not to discuss how different societies, different cultures will treat similar challenges. We are willing to discuss how economic considerations will impact it, but we are not willing to discuss how cultural um, uh, assumptions, how they, a different culture treats this kind of a problem compared to how another culture, particularly our own culture, will deal this, with the same problem. So the assumption is that Putin is just like us, or Russian politics is just like our politics. Okay, there's a difference here and there. They speak a different language. They may have different priorities on a minor scale, but when it comes to the big decisions, we have to consider them in a very similar way that we consider ourselves. To give one example about Russia, I will later give some about the Middle East. The assumption is that interdependence, namely, since they are dependent on our money, it is okay if we are dependent on their gas, on their energy, because interdependence means that it doesn't pay to any of the parties to come into confrontation to undermine what they're getting from the other side because they want something more. And the assumption is if there is interdependence, then you can negotiate, negotiate things around the conference table because after all, we all want a good life. This is associated with a fantasy that was developed in the West, particularly in Europe, about what they call the international community. Namely, there is such a thing as if uh, the, the world in general has a will and according to 
international law, nations will have to abide uh, by that rule, by that will that the international community is dictating. It finally comes down to the United Nations and bodies like the United Nations. And the assumption is that this kind of international will, the international community can determine through international law, the behavior of nations. Now, is it something that can work very well with democratic societies, open societies? It can work very well in Europe, between Europe and North America, or countries like uh, Israel or, or Australia. The question is, can you assume that Putin or Russia in general is bound by the same rules of the game? And the idea that in the final analysis, you can rely on this system to produce a more stable world is proven again and again as being unsubstantiated. So when a war like the war in Ukraine breaks out, people are very surprised because they consider these kinds of wars as being something of the past. They belong to the 20th century, to the first half of the 20th century. They can no longer again happen because we live in a different world, a world of, as I said before, interdependence and international law and the will of the international community and so on. So don't assume, don't prepare yourself, don't de defend yourself, don't prepare yourself to defend against such a behavior because the likelihood of it is very, very small if at all existed. And this is very closely associated with the unwillingness of the West in general, and particularly of the Europeans, to defend themselves. So they have small armies, the rate of the, the preparedness, the level of the, the preparedness for war is extremely low. The assumption in Europe for a long time was a war of the kind that we are seeing now cannot happen. And if anything of a major caliber will happen in Europe, Anyway, the Americans will come to defend us. And in America, you also had very strong currents. If you want the most extreme uh, demonstration of it, you will see it among progressives who also started from the same assumption. Again, international law, international community, interdependence, the soft power, the need, there is no need or very little need to prepare for war if you want peace based on the uh, old dictum, civis patsem parabellum, he who wants peace should prepare for war. And you had a very low level of willingness to engage in confrontations if they're absolutely necessary as a last resort and the willingness to do something so that the other side is deterred from the kind of wars that we've seen in the Ukraine. We have something that similar, although there are important differences, also in the Middle East. Looking at the Middle East from the West, looking at the Middle East from the United States, particularly from Europe, there was a very simple-minded perception of the region. First of all, an unwillingness to recognize how much culture has a tremendous effect on behavior. Again, the assumption was that economic considerations are dominant if the life, um, the uh, standard of living will be raised, if opportunities for jobs will be created, if they will be treated in the Middle East in a better way from the West or from Israel, then we will have a process, a long process, admittedly, even by people who were, uh, in, in my view, somewhat too optimistic in the Middle East, in, in, in the West about the Middle East, they expected it to be a process and sometimes even admitted that it can be relatively long. But the assumption was, if we invest more attention into the Middle East and the standard of living in the Middle East will rise, and particularly if the peoples in the region will overthrow or replace 
the uh, corrupt leadership, the um, very dictatorial leadership, then inevitably we will get in the Middle East a more democratic attitude, a more open attitude, a process of democratization, if not the Jeffersonian democracy immediately, but a process of uh, democratization. And there was the assumption that there are a few radicals out there, but if you look at the overall picture, you can work with the uh, people who want a better life and a, a democratic, a more democratic Middle East is possible. And to this, there was an addition to my mind, one of the completely unfounded expectations that once you deal with the Israeli-Palestinian confrontation, then the Middle East will be, if not stabilized, at least it will be on the way to stabilization. In many quarters of Europe and some in the United States, the region was, the, the Israeli-Palestinian confrontation was called the problem of the Middle East, the Middle East issue, the Middle East confrontation, on the assumption that once you settle it, once you come up with a solution, the very use of the term in my mind is ridiculous, the idea of a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian part of the Arab-Israeli conflict, this will stabilize the Middle East or at least put the the region on the road to stabilization, or at least will be in a very major way less unstable than it is today. And the understanding that you have forces in the Middle East that have nothing whatsoever to do with Israel or with the Palestinians, that if, if Israel would not have existed, the tensions in the Middle East would be still very, very high, because if you forget Israel for a moment and you look at what is happening in the region, regardless of Israel, you will find confrontations and civil war and misery that have nothing whatsoever to do with Israel or the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the assumption that if you have it among Arabs, if you have it um, between Sunnis and Shiites, between different Sunnis among themselves, different Shiites, among themselves. If this is what the Middle East is suffering from for more than 100 years since they became partly independent and later fully independent, you can't expect Arab radicals to treat Israel better than they treat each other, better than they treat their own brothers. And the assumption was if you just remove the Arab-Israeli conflict or what was considered wrongly as the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict, namely the Palestinian dimension of the conflict, you can stabilize the region. What we have learned, and I think the Arab, so-called Arab Spring, was the event, the most important event where we can learn about it, is that even when you remove a dictator, what replaces him is very often worse than the previous dictator. Not that the previous dictator is good, but there is no mainstream in the Arab world that is capable of producing a kind of more open society, more pluralistic society. There is a fundamental problem with, with pluralism throughout the Arab world. Now, is the Arab world a monolith? No. Are there differences within the Arab world? Yes, but there is also a common denominator. And the common denominator is a deep deficiency in pluralism that starts in the family, that starts in the society and reflects itself also on the political level. The problem is not that there are no moderates in the Middle East, to use the terms that people in the West uh, like to use, but that the radicals can dictate the agenda even if the moderates are the majority. So the important part is again focus on the cultures of the Middle East. Don't assume that you can, for instance, bring democracy to Iraq in the beginning of our century, of the new century, 
the assumption that when the Americans come to Iraq or to Afghanistan, they can bring with them rights for women, a democratic political system. These societies are not ripe for it. Don't start on the assumption that if somebody comes to power through elections, this means that this is the beginning of the process of democratization. In Turkey, the situation became much worse after Erdogan was elected by the people because he represents an approach of the Muslim Brothers that is essentially anti-democratic and anti-pluralistic. It may take time for it to manifest itself, but it's there. Don't assume that if you get rid of Mubarak and you have elections in Egypt and the Muslim Brothers come to power, you will have a process of democratization just because you had elections. If we would not have had the military coup in 2013, in Egypt you would have had a reality that is dramatically worse than today because in addition to oppression inside Egypt, you would also have confrontations between Egypt and other countries, Israel and other countries in the region, because what we've learned about the Muslim Brothers, what we should have learned about the Muslim Brothers is that they can pretend to be willing to uh, compromise, but in the final analysis, their oppressive uh, attitude inside the society also reflects itself outside. So what I'm suggesting is, look at the Middle East by taking into account in a very major way the um, cultures of the region and don't let your expectations and your desires to see a more stable world blind you about regions of the world where it is not possible at the moment. Europe has produced the most impressive achievement by turning a slaughterhouse, which Europe used to be until the middle of the previous century, into a flourishing, free welfare society with enormous achievements in terms of the quality of life, not, under, not only the standard of living, but the quality of life. But this is because the infrastructure, the cultural infrastructure was there and they could develop it. This infrastructure developed since the Renaissance and you had foundations to work on it. Yes, you had terrible diversions like the Nazi period in Germany, but there is also the foundation for a pluralistic society. That at the moment does not exist in the Middle East, in among Arab states, and certainly not in uh, Russia under Putin. Although again, it is possible. Cultural changes can happen. It is not in the DNA of people. We had in Turkey, a Muslim country, we had two cultural revolutions within one century. A positive one under Ataturk and a negative one under Erdogan. So cultural change is possible, but don't assume that it must develop in the more pluralistic direction it can become even worse as it did in the Arab world with Islamic radicalism. It can, when you come to the so-called Arab Spring, produce a worse situation in Libya after you remove Gaddafi, that you, it can be even worse in Syria than before the Arab Spring. It must not inevitably lead to a democracy even in Tunisia where things are somewhat better. So look at the region realistically. Don't let your wishful thinking dominate your strategic analysis. Focus on the issue of culture. Try to help people in the region stabilize. Yes, try to find settlements for certain conflicts and tensions, but don't expect solutions that will make the Middle East a, a peaceful region. Coming back to Russia, Putin is reflecting something very deep in Russian history. Do you also have other, other things in Russian history? Yes, 
but don't assume that they must dominate. Don't start on the assumption that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you must have a process towards a more accommodating Russia because something like Putin can happen. And we know that he, it can happen because it did happen. And what you have now is a brutal war of a brutal system of a society that is not ready to be part of this peaceful Europe that to, promises a better quality of life for all its citizens. And also, one last remark, don't assume that dictators are smart just because you don't know what is happening inside. I think Putin made the worst mistake he could have made on two levels. So don't assume that since he is very sophisticated when it comes to tactics or moves on the operative level, he is also smart when it comes to grand strategy. He was very foolish in his active acts in the Ukraine. First, because he deprived of himself of the greatest weapon Putin had, namely the total inability of Europe to defend itself. Europe is now in a position to understand better to need to invest in self-defense and not only money, also attention, cultural willingness to consider self-defense a positive thing, even if it is not based exclusively on soft power, even if it needs in the final analysis here and there to use hard power. So he was stupid by depriving himself of his number one weapon, namely the inability of Europe to defend itself and the unwillingness of many Americans to do the right thing about it. Second, in the final analysis, Putin should fear China because China is hungry for resources that Russia has in abundance. In Russia, you have a small people on a huge territory and the population is getting not only smaller, but also a lot of the best parts of the people in Russia are leaving Russia because of what Putin is doing inside Russia. So actually the interest of Putin would have been to be together with the West against China because the immediate threat on Russia is China and not the West. Now he made himself an enemy of the West and he cannot in the long run rely on China. So start on the assumption that people who you cannot see the stupidity of nevertheless can be stupid, although the regime makes it difficult to see how stupid they are, how, how many very serious strategic mistakes you can make. So my final advice facing these two misconceptions is study strategically the history it will give you a starting point it, history doesn't have to repeat itself but you cannot ignore it focus on culture among other things and don't let your wishful thinking dictate your strategic analysis thank you thank you sir uh, thank you dr dan softon Thank you so much for a very interesting, very enlightening, thought-provoking and comprehensive remarks. Uh, we have received around 20-25 questions and I'm sure it will be doubled in a few minutes. So without wasting any time, let me share some of the questions. The first question is that how far has sanctions been effective in deterring Russia at the Russia-Ukraine war? Uh, we see Russia is reeling under sanctions, oil price cap is soon to follow. Uh, will that have an impact? How does this war impact the economy of the world? First of all, sanctions can be very effective, provided you keep them on a high level and you go in the direction where it really hurts. If you go to individuals, it's a good complementary 
a set of actions. It helps if you also go after individuals, but do it more comprehensive. Don't start on the assumption, the wrong assumption. Let us not have sanctions that will hurt the Russian people because we can single out Putin from the Russian people. If Putin is not perceived as a failure because the Russian, he cannot provide to the Russian people what the Russian people want, you will not be able to undermine it. So take the sanctions far and then further and further and further. This is number one. Number two, don't expect sanctions to be the only instrument in your toolbox. You need, in addition to sanctions, help you, the Ukraine fight Russia. The more the failure of the war is clear to the Russian people, this is where the battlefield is. The battlefield is not in Kherson. The battlefield is in Moscow. The battlefield is, is in St. Petersburg. The, the battlefield is throughout Russia. The failure of the Russian army. Basically, Putin told the Russians, you will not have democracy and you will not have pluralism and you will uh, let our uh, kind of people establish a kleptocracy where you're being uh, stolen of your resources and a few people become rich and whatever, but I will make Russia great and the Russian army will make Russia a great power again and we will be able to dictate our will. When the people in Russia see that Putin is not only a failure inside Russia, where outside of the big cities, you have, for instance, uh, health systems that are 19th century health systems. He is not only a failure there, he is also a failure when it comes to the Russian army. So help the Ukrainians demonstrate that the Russian army is failing, that it cannot achieve its, um, its objectives. And finally, since there is already a war going on on cyber from Russia vis-a-vis -vis the, vis -vis the West, do it also in the other direction. You don't have to start a world war. You don't have to um, start bringing in nuclear weapons or something. You must build your armies, your conventional armies, so that when you want to use hard power, when you don't have a choice but to use hard power, you will be able, you will have something to do it with, not with the kind of uh, armies that, that NATO has now. You need to make them much more prepared for war. So again, to conclude, sanctions are good. They must be deepened. They must be biting. They must be long-standing for many years. And it must not be your only instrument in your toolbox. Develop the others and prepare yourself for conventional confrontation, because if you want to keep it underneath the um, nuclear level, you must have the instruments to do it with. Uh, so there is another question related to United Nations Security Council. Do you think that the dynamics of the permanent member of United Nations Security Council change upon prolonging the conflict, uh, will this affect the UN as a whole in the foreseeable future? No, the UN is not only a failure and, and a com completely irrelevant to what is happening in the world. It is, only a, it is also a place where because the majority of members of the United Nations are authoritarian countries and some of them are barbaric countries, and you cannot get anything done there without this majority. The Security Council is neutralized by the fact that the powers have a veto, so you can't use it against Russia, you can't use it against an aggression of a permanent member of the Security Council. And in the General Assembly, most of their uh, decisions are so ridiculous and so separate from reality. They're using the terminology of um, democratic societies so that the barbarians demonstrate the barbarians will define what democracy is and what uh, human rights are. And it is also also repulsive and so um, twisted that nobody takes it seriously. <laughs> 
I don't think that the United Nations is an instrument to deal with any kind of conflict effectively. The only impact the United Nations has when it comes to international conflict is negative. Uh, so do you think that Europe is going to be divided into two major blocks uh, with the crisis at the moment? The major blocks are the United States and China with all the importance of Russia and all the importance of the war in Ukraine. The most important global question is to what extent will China manage to impose the kind of um, rule and the kind of rules of the games that they want on larger and larger parts of the world. The Chinese are not ready yet to replace America as the force that determines the um, world order, but they're imposing their will on large parts of the world. And also we should all remember that China has domestically the most oppressive regime ever in human history because it is totalitarian. It combines a cultural elements that uh, are there in China for a very long time with modern technology that makes surveillance of the individual more possible than ever in the past. So the question is to what extent will this standard be applied in other parts of the world? And the only real struggle on the global level today is between the United States and its allies on the one hand and China on the other. Russia at the moment is working with China and it, as I mentioned before, I think it is a mistake by the Russians, but with all the importance of Russia as a nuclear power and Russia and the war that Russia is conducting in the Ukraine, when it comes to the global scene, the focus is not there. So you just mentioned China and the nuclear power, and we've got lots of questions uh, within that uh, framework. Like China has supported Russia's action in Ukraine. How is it going to impact Europe-China relations? How is Europe's reaction towards China? That is one. Second is that Russian invasion of Ukraine has seen large scale war return to Europe after for the first time in nearly 80 years uh, after the Second World War with many in the West concerned about the conflict escalating towards a confrontation between two nuclear powers. So how do you see this? Do you see a nuclear war trailing between, uh, at the moment? I don't think, there is a tension between Russia and China, and I'm not an expert on this subject, so I let people who are better informed and have more knowledge on the subject uh, to speak on these issues. Uh, concerning a nuclear confrontation in Europe, it is of course a possibility. I mean, you cannot exclude it because Putin was irresponsible enough to put on the table this possibility. And usually when the Russians say that the Ukrainians are preparing something, it's, it's because the Russians want to do it or consider doing it and want to blame it on the Ukrainians. I mean, the, uh, Russia has uh, lied uh, in such a ridiculous way about uh, what is happening in the Ukraine that you cannot assume again that you can consume what is coming out of Russia the way you are consuming information that comes out of the democratic world. They're willing to sometimes uh, say things that are so ridiculously untrue that it cannot be taken seriously. Like for instance, uh, saying that the um, uh, unmanned aircraft that uh, they're using, the Iranian uh, uh, machines that they are using in Ukraine, this is not you. This is not Iranian, and so on. I mean, you must realize that there is a an irresponsible leader of Russia, and that he has already taken steps that are irresponsible. To, so to say that this is completely impossible that something nuclear was, will happen will be irresponsible. The likelihood of it is small, but 
if you take together the small likelihood and the enormous catastrophe, if this will uh, go further, it means that you cannot disregard this possibility. But what will happen, I don't think that anybody will dare make um, an assumption there. Uh, I can only say one thing, if it turns out that the people who said it will not happen were wrong, I think most of us will not live to blame the people who were wrong about the analysis on the subject. So perhaps this can be a consolation for the people who make predictions there. Uh, sir, how do you look at the role of Israel, uh, where you are located in this whole conflict? Where do Israel stand and uh, what kind of role it is playing at the moment? Uh, I assume you mean um, Europe and not what I said in the Middle East. In the Middle East, Israel has a very major role. Israel is a, a regional power for the first time. It is a full-scale regional pow power because until recently, Israel was only a regional power in military terms and in economic terms, but it could not maneuver inside the Middle East between the different Arab states. Now we are, Israel is in a position to do that as well. So in terms of what, uh, of the Middle East, Israel is a very important power and it has an enormous impact. And there is recognition in the Arab world of the importance of Israel. Let me put it this way, in the Arab world to simplify it, but nevertheless, it's the correct direction. Arabs are weak, Iran is dangerous, the United States, as Obama demonstrated, can uh, not always be trusted. Uh, Israel is much more trustworthy, so let's work with Israel and um, uh, hope that the United States will be with us. This, in the Middle East, Israel has a major role. In Europe, I think Israel has a negligible role. Um, the expectations that Israel can change uh, the war in the Ukraine are based on the misunderstanding of what Israel has and doesn't have. Israel developed instruments that are very good for a small country and it can defend itself because it is so small against the missiles that uh, the Palestinians and the uh, people from Hezbollah under Iranian guidance are sending against Israel. But when it comes to the vast territory of the Ukraine, even if Israel would have supplied her um, uh, Iron Dome to the Ukraine, the impact would have been very limited. And anyway, this would lead to a confrontation between Israel and Russia that Israel cannot afford. And you cannot have, Russia has an enormous arsenal of things that they have produced and things that they are producing and things that they are purchasing. So the numbers that Israel has are limited in terms of what it can do. The impact will be minor, if not negligible. I think that uh, the Ukrainians are making a mistake by putting Israel on the spot, they, it can perhaps create for Israel some unpleasant situations, but they're not helping themselves by emphasizing this element. So from an Israeli point of view, the impact that Israel can have on the war of, in the Ukraine is marginal, if not negligible, the damage that it can cause major Israeli interests, particularly the uh, danger of confrontation between Israel and Russia in Syria, are such that the balance of interests of Israel are such that I don't think that any responsible Israeli government will become involved in a major way in, uh, in the Ukraine. Now, if Israel could have had a major impact on the war, Israel would have a dilemma. But since the impact anyhow will be negligible, there is no dilemma from an Israeli point of view. Uh, so, uh, according to you, what is the role of Ukraine still towards West and the NATO in this conflict? 
is that not the cause of all this conflict? Why uh, Ukraine is so much obsessed of being a part of the NATO? First of all, Ukraine is obsessed today about becoming part of NATO because we have seen that unless you are a part of NATO, Russia will devour you. For instance, if the Baltic countries were not part of NATO, I think that Putin would have first of all occupied these three countries and they would cease to exist because this is the expansionist uh, perception of uh, Putin and this would be the first step that he would take. So now I understand it very well, but is this the reason why he invaded? No, I don't think so. I think the reason is that he realized that if he cannot control the government in Kiev, he must topple it through military means. If he cannot do it through espionage and cyber and uh, his agents and Russian agents in the Ukraine, he must bring in the Russian army. And the reason he wants to, uh, to dominate the Ukraine has to do with his regime in Russia. In other words, from his point of view, the Ukrainians are basically Russians. And if the Ukrainians have decided that they want to live a life like people in Western Europe live, a much better life with a much higher quality of life, his threat was that the Ukraine will join the European Union because it could have been very easy for him to say, look, if you join NATO, we will invade, or if you will start the process of joining NATO, we will invade. And this would have deterred even the United States from bringing the Ukraine into NATO. I don't think that this was a realistic proposition. What he was afraid of is that the Russians, because he treats the Ukrainians as if they're just Russians. If the Russians in Ukraine want to have a better life and therefore go in the direction of the European Union, Russians in Russia will say, we want also a pluralistic system and a better economic situation and less corruption and um, uh, less, um, you know, a small group of people stealing billions from the Russian people. And he was afraid of the impact in Russia. And therefore, I don't think that you can attribute the beginning of the war, the motivation of the war, to the danger from a Russian point of view of the Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, so there are lots of questions also related to the role of the United States in this whole uh, crisis or conflict. So how do you look at the role of US and uh, how long is this conflict going to be according to you? First of all, I think that it's interesting that the first step that Putin took in this direction in the Ukraine was under Obama. Because the message that Obama has sent to the world is, I am projecting weakness. The United States wants to stop playing the role of leading the world order. And this very negative message had extremely negative consequences throughout the world because the message was basically the United States will support its enemies and undermine its allies. This was the perception under Obama in the Middle East by both Arabs and Israelis. This was the perception in Japan. This was the perception in India. This was the perception about people in Asia who are afraid of China and weakness of the United States that was so emphasized under Obama as his objective. This kind of weakness had a tremendous negative impact on the standing of the United States in the world and it motivated Putin to do it under Obama when he took Crimea and he instigated the civil war in the Russian parts of, uh, of the Ukraine. And it's interesting that under Trump, 
he did not take a further step, not perhaps because he was um, sure that Trump is a strong president, but because he Trump was unpredictable. Obama was predictable. He will do nothing. Trump was unpredictable. And I think he underestimated Biden because he assumed that Biden will just be a weaker um, replication of Obama. And it turns out that Biden is not willing to go as far as Obama in this direction. Now, is he still, unfortunately, on a similar course? For instance, in the Middle East, trying to strengthen Iran by signing the uh, JCPOA, by coming back to the JCPOA, and undermining Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Israel, in the beginning of the Biden administration, that seemed to be the case. Biden has learned and is now, first of all, much less problematic than uh, Obama. And second, when it comes at least to the Middle East, what you see is that on the one hand, he's still willing to sign a very, very, very bad agreement with Iran that will strengthen Iran, that will help Iran dominate the Middle East. But at the same time, he is no longer trying to weaken Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Egypt and the Emirates. He is willing to help in the defense of these countries. So again, is it problematic? Yes. Is it not as good as it used to be under presidents who understood, in my view, the people who understood the Middle East, the, the best were Nixon and Kissinger in their time. But uh, the role of the United States globally is now not as encouraging aggression as under Obama. When it comes specifically to what Biden did in the Ukraine, so far he basically did the right thing. First of all, the very large and very extensive and very deep military help by the United States to the Ukraine has contributed dramatically, decisively, to the fact that Russia is losing in the Ukraine. And I think it, the combination of sanctions and military assistance, we are speaking about the tens of billions of dollars of American assistance to the Ukraine. And I think it is a good decision because American involvement costs so much that helping other countries that are willing to fight for themselves is relatively inexpensive compared to, uh, compared to American involvement. There is also something else that is very encouraging, namely that the Democrats are trying to be tougher than the Republicans on China. So you don't have a situation where you have the Democrats on the side of saying, let's appease the other side. But there is a competition who is tougher on the Ukraine and the Democrats want to be tougher. So it helps very much domestically in the United States to get support for this kind of, um, for this kind of policy. So to sum up the combination of sanctions, and I hope that they will be deepened and that they will last for very long. Uh, in the United States and the willingness to help NATO rebuild itself and the uh, assistance to, to the Ukraine, the direct military assistance to the Ukraine. And I assume, I have not studied it very closely, but making the American military better prepared for a possible confrontation because a confrontation became more possible and the understanding that there is a direct link between the Russian aggression in the Ukraine and the Chinese uh, aggression in Taiwan. So, and I hope one day they will also understand that there is a direct link between the Iranian aggression in the Middle East. So 
there is a broader global view that is today more realistic than we've had for many years. Uh, thank you, sir. We are running out of time. We hardly have seven minutes, but still we have around 20 to 30 questions. There are lots of questions coming on Russia, like how is the Russian people reacting to Putin's action in Ukraine? Uh, is there any hope that Ukraine can win this war? Uh, what the, uh, was the Russia-Ukraine war completely unavoidable? How did uh, how do you look at uh, look at it at the global? Uh, I mean, what are the nations for the world at the moment, like uh, for Europe, for Russia, or for rest of the world? Uh, similarly, there are lots of questions that is Russia going to regret uh, for the war in Ukraine? And there are many other questions, like how do you look at the global and European reaction in the initial days, like claiming that Russia will never attack Ukraine uh, when, the, when, the, when it does not take, uh, have taken place. So how do you look at overall these scenarios uh, at the moment? Well, a lot of it we've already discussed, namely that Europe is today much more realistic than before. In Germany, the most important country in Europe, it is important that the person in power today, the party in power today, is the SPD, and it is a socialist in Europe, namely the uh, Councillor Scholz, that is willing to speak about what the Germans call Zeitenwende, namely a profound change. Times have changed in a very fundamental way. Uh, the willingness of um, both Britain and Germany to top their military expenditure from approximately um, a half a billion, uh, from approximately 500 billion euros to approximately um, 100 billion euros. I mean, it's somewhat different between Germany and Britain, but this is the order of magnitude and this is very important. So rebuilding the armies, making them prepared for war, a willingness to take sanctions, willingness of even the European Union to be involved in sending arms, the joining of Sweden and Finland to Europe. This is very important, Finland, because it borders on Russia and it understands that it now needs the protection of, um, of NATO. The Swedes that tried to play both sides and they were, they have this tradition of being neutral and they tried not to be part of NATO and there was an ideology uh, of not being uh, part of NATO, a very deep ideology. And again, you have a, ve a very profound change in Sweden, by the way, not only in the attitude to Russia, but also in the attitude to um, refugees, I think this is important, the understanding that you must protect your countries also against unwanted refugees in unwanted numbers, namely that immigration should be something that every country should consider according to its needs and not that it has an unlimited um, uh, obligation to accept everybody in whatever numbers and whoever is coming must be let in. So this change in Europe uh, of going back from the fantasies of recent decades to a more realistic attitude is one, uh, one impact. In the United States, I'm delighted to say that so far the progressives did not have a ma any major impact on strategic decision makings. The progressives in America are as disconnected from reality as Europeans were until the war in Ukraine. And at the moment, they have no impact or very little impact on the American action in, uh, in the world. Even though many of them are harsh on Russia because of the Ukraine, it does not reflect itself in the understanding of other uh, major issues, including the one in the Middle East, where progressives are still completely cut off from uh, reality. Concerning Russia itself, again, I'm not an expert on Russia. You need to speak to somebody who's more knowledgeable than, than me, but 
what I read from people who are knowledgeable about Russia, there is the kind of unrest in Russia today that we haven't seen for a very long time. Basically, Putin broke his um, arrangement with the Russian people. Let me control you and let me steal your money and I will make Russia great and I will not take your boys to serve in, in, in the army. Now, the fact that he cannot deal with what he has in the army and he has to recruit uh, so many um, uh, so many Russians to come and um, uh, join the war. And these Russians are coming, they're unprepared, they're untrained. They will be seeing themselves, at least part of them, as cannon fodder. This will be something that will undermine Putin's position inside Russia. Now, do you have an oppressive regime so that it doesn't show? Yes, but can you keep it indefinitely? I don't know. Again, uh, I'm sure even the experts can't give you a definite answer, but I'm not an expert about Russia, so I'll um, remain on this level. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shoftan. Uh, finally, we have come to the end of the discussion. Uh, we still have lots of questions, but due to time constraints, we are unable to take them. We are really thankful for your time and for your very insightful discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, we hope to have you again in the future, maybe in Rio and Kathmandu, uh, since the COVID is over. We'd also like to thank our participants for their wonderful question. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you.